Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here with us today. Um, if you have questions, uh, you know our email, telephone number, you can call. Love to have you come to church. We're in Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath dealt treacherously, an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your truth, your way. Father, we thank you and pray for the brethren around the world that are suffering persecution. Father, we thank you for our privilege to live here yet free and yet without any other persecution than bad words. Father, we pray that uh, you'd give us strength as the persecution gets stronger and your truth to stay true to you. Thank you for your goodness, your grace, and blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I'm sure if uh, you're watching this, uh, you probably noticed that there may be um, a large amount of teeth missing from my mouth. Uh, the reason for that is uh, they were extracted this week. Um, I'm in the process of getting dentures that um, I can wear that are not extremely painful. Uh, right now, they are, having just had my teeth extracted. Uh, it's part of the aging process that happens to some people. Uh, I have two options. I can uh, not preach, or I can preach without my teeth. I chose to do it that way. Uh, we are supposed to be uh, humble, and uh, we're not supposed to be vain. So uh, you shouldn't complain if uh, I'm preaching up here a work in progress with my teeth uh, uh, not being uh, able to work yet in uh, my mouth because it's just too sore. That's the end of that story. Let's get back to the Word of God. Often, the books of the prophets are viewed by modern saints as antiquated historical literature, penned millennia ago by seers whose messages have little application to those living in the 21st century. Nothing could be further from the truth. You see, God is dealing with his people. Malachi is the last of the prophets. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? That's very important because we live in a world today of confusion, especially in Christianity. The reason for that is people have been resting the scriptures to their own destruction. People don't seem to know what they're doing, and people have no comprehension of time and judgment. And what I mean by that, I can just give you a simple illustration. Uh, this morning as I was studying preparing, um, I was looking at other messages from other pastors, and I see this individual was preaching against, um, which we, we'll call him the conservative nominee, and he was very much concerned that he was not always uh, anti-abortion. And uh, that's understandable if this was back during the uh, Republican debates and you had 16 candidates to choose from, you should be supporting the one that you favored. For myself, I personally was a supporter of um, the gentleman from Texas, and uh, I would have preferred to see him get the nomination. He appeared to be the most Christian of the candidates, but he didn't win. And now we're down to this general election. And we have a woman that uh, believes in abortion, and we have a man that says he's against abortion. Uh, there's really nothing to uh, consider. You have, you have to make a choice between the two. You don't have any more options. And um, for me, I've got to choose the guy that says whether he means it or not. That's what he's saying. You have a choice between one that is a nationalist and one that's a globalist. It's pretty cut and dry. Whether he's telling the truth or not, you have to vote for the nationalist. If you're a Christian and you know your Bible and you know about the Tower of Babel and you know about the Mark of the Beast, you know about the one world government. As a Christian, I do not want my country to be in the global community. And of course, if you believe that way, uh, the left, the, they, they want to portray you as being mad and insane. You, there's something wrong with you if you're a constitutionalist, if you're a nationalist, 
if you believe politically that way. Now, that's politics. We have the same thing happening in the doctrines of Christ. And a lot of strange doctrines. The Bible tells us in the last days that there will be a lot of false spirits. And that's what we're dealing with. Have we not all one Father? It's just only one. Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of fathers? This took place in the times of Israel, and it's dividing the body of Christ today. The body of Christ should not be divided. The body of Christ should be studying the word of God, know the word of God, and be united in God's word. But laziness, the flesh and the devil, bringing all kinds of heretical doctrines and teachings into the Christian church, into the body of Christ. That's sad. It's a lot of confusion. And there's no excuse for this because the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The book of Malachi opens with a declaration of God's unconditional love for his people. Whether you were an Old Testament saint or a New Testament born-again Christian under the new covenant in Christ's shed blood, God loves you. God loves his people. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. God loves his people. In the Old Testament, God loved Israel. In the New Testament, God loves the body of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not a son in the world, condemned the world, for the world through him might be saved. God is love. God loves his people. The problem is not God. The problem is the sins of the people and the lack of love from the people to God. And sad to say, the love of God's people to their creator and savior. Malachi then ends his prophecy with a final warning to God's people concerning the coming of the day of the Lord, which will include the coming of Elijah and the Messiah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet for the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now we know what thousands have thought they'd known at various points in history and were wrong. And people say, well, how, come, how do you know you're not wrong? Well, because prophecy is being fulfilled. You see, there's been times throughout history, and I could list them for you, that people believe the end of the age was coming, and even more confused, they believe the end of the world. There's no end of the world in the scriptures. The Bible tells you very clearly the world's without end. There's the end of ages, there's changes, there's cataclysmic destruction, but it doesn't destroy the entire earth in the Great Tribulation. You have a millennium, you have the age of ages, you go out to eternity. There's no ending to the earth. So you see, somebody isn't loving God, reading their Bible, and paying attention to the truth. People are uttering perverse things from their heart and mind that they just have imagined without facts or truth. And that's what's happening in the body of Christ today. And God's warning his people but it's even with love. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers. A man of God, a preacher, teacher, prophet, or Elijah, the purpose is to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. The fathers are Abraham and Moses, those prophets that God used, the apostle Paul, to lay the foundation. Today, as Christians in the New Testament, our founding father would be Paul, where for the Jews it was Abraham. They brought the message of God to the people. God used those men. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
anybody that's saved today would really have to consider the Apostle Paul their spiritual father if you went back to history. As the Jewish people looked to Abraham as their founding father. The thing that was unique with Abraham and Paul, they loved God. They served God. They were called of God. They obeyed God. And they separated themselves unto God. And that's what God's looking for in his people. Now, this call and this warning and this love is preceded by a call to remembrance of the law of Moses. God said, in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every purpose and every work time and judgment. Here Solomon is realizing and comprehending that God is going to judge the righteous. That's his people and the wicked. And it's coming soon. There is a judgment seat of Christ for the body of Christ. There's the great white throne judgment for the infidel, for the rejecter, for the unsaved, for the lost. And they come when the Lord comes. And so there's this call to remember the law. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I command unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. As a call to remember the righteousness and morality of the law. Today there is an extremely false teaching that we can be saved by grace and live for the devil. This is false in both the Old and the New Testament. Romans was very clear. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness out of sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. We are saved by grace. We are kept by grace. The law can have nothing to do with our salvation because we have broken the law. The law can only inform us and show us and tell us of our sinfulness and our sin. And therefore the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But the law has always been godly, holy, and righteous, and true. And because we are saved by grace, this is not a license. To sin. It's the opposite. It's a call to walk in the Spirit. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. God forbids his people to sin even after he saved them by his grace. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, true salvation comes from repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. An individual is living his life in his own will, in his own self-righteousness, and then the Holy Spirit convicts him through the preaching of the gospel that his way is the wrong way and God's way is the right way. God gives grace when there's repentance. Paul preached repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So our salvation has nothing to do with the keeping of the law. Our salvation is necessary, our redemption is because we broke the law. That does not make the law wrong, evil, or not applicable to instructing us in righteousness. The moral law of God is good for the New Testament saints, saved by grace, because it is holy, it is just and good, revealing sin in us, and that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Know ye not to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. When we walk in the righteousness of the law, 
in the holiness of the law and the morality of the law, we are obeying God's righteousness. When we as saved Christians disobey, uh, we are in sin and death. We were the servants of sin. Now, if you love God, we are to keep his commandments. And that's what I encourage you to do today, contrary to what false doctrines are being taught. If you love God, keep his commandments. Again, because the confusion as the anti-American, liberal, and that's the term they use, communistic, socialistic philosophies are taunting Americans that believe in Constitution and the American way and nationalism as being extremist, out of date, and, and crazy. So the spirits of devils are challenging the body of Christ and claiming that you have a liberty to sin because you're saved by grace, which is contrary to God's word, God forbid. And that's what's happening in the body of Christ today. There is this doctrine, well, you're saved, your past sins are forgiven, your future sins are forgiven, your present sins are forgiven, which is all true. And you will not give account to them you have eternal security or eternal life and you cannot lose your soul because Jesus paid it all and the blood of Christ cleansed us from all our sins, which is true, but that never was a license to continue sinning. Quite on the contrary, that was the encouragement to walk in righteousness. Because if you repent, it's my way was wrong and I'm turning to God's way. It's that simple. But there's a great in the last days, there will be seducing spirits, and they're through the body of Christ, telling Christians, you can, you can, uh, you can um, trust in Jesus and dance with Marvin Gaye. That's not God's way. Come ye out and be a shepherd, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you. Again, New Testament, not Old Testament, but the righteousness of the Old Testament and the righteousness of the New Testament, right is always right, wrong is always wrong, good is always good, bad is always bad. But we have a confusion today that they call good, bad, and bad, good. And God condemns that. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The law's purpose was to show sin and show it as exceedingly sinful. Where we know that we cannot be saved by keeping the law, I understand that. God's doctrine is so. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. Our salvation's in God's grace. It's an unmerited favor that comes through the shed blood of Christ who died for our sins. He did not save us for us to sin. He saved us for us to follow him. He saved us to serve God, which was our original purpose in God's creation. Those who love their Lord and Savior certainly seek to keep his commandments and his ways. If you love me, keep my commandments. Remember earlier I said, God loves us. There's no doubt of it. God has died for us. God will do what is required to redeem us and sacrifice himself for us. But as the Apostle Paul said, so it is with God. The more I love, the less I be loved. It is such in human nature that when one loves and sacrifices, the nature often takes advantage rather than is thankful.
And that's what's happening in this body today. Where we should be thanking God and serving God and walking in the spirit and newness of life. Christians are taking advantage. And some, and only God knows, are probably not even being converted and being saved. Only God knows where the line is. I know that all my sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins have been forgiven, but I also know that there is an expectation now for me to walk in the Spirit and fulfill the righteousness of the law, not to live like a scoundrel from which I repented. If you love me, keep my commandments. The reason for this is so we don't come under the bondage of sin again by those who disgrace the Lord's grace. And here, the book of James is a transitional book from the doctrine of grace found in the Pauline epistles to a salvation where your soul can be lost because you're in the tribulation and you don't have the operation made without hands that's in our time. And this is what they'll be doing and it's happening now spiritually to save born again Christians. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. And there are false preachers and teachers today teaching Christians that because they're saved by grace, they have a liberty to do anything their heart desires. God forbid. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. Those who are saved by grace and love the Savior are under law to Jesus Christ, their Savior, to walk in the Spirit so the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in them. New Testament, not Old Testament, Pauline epistles, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be, uh, be spiritually minded is life and peace. An individual that is living in carnality, in sensuality, does not have the spirit. And they're not walking in the spirit. If we're walking in the spirit, we're interested in fulfilling the righteousness of the law. We are to stand in liberty of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and not the concupiscence, concupiscence of the flesh. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The liberty is a freedom from sin to walk in the Spirit. That's what God has for us which is a liberty from sin, it is never a license to sin. For brethren, ye have been called on to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Remember, God is love, but godly love is a holy love and a moral love, not a lust. The preachers of God should be preaching and teaching people to love their Savior and serve him out of a heart of love and thankfulness and to put on Christ and walk in his spirit. Not to be at liberty for the flesh to sin, but to be at liberty from the bondage of sin. What makes sin real sin? It is that it harms either God's holiness or man's person. Walk in the Spirit, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. The Bible is very clear. The world is crooked and perverse. And the nation in which we dwell is crooked and perverse. 
We are to shine as lights in the world without rebuke because we're blameless and harmless. People that are walking in the spirit are not harming and hurting other people. Therefore, our glorious liberty in Jesus Christ, the righteous, does not grant us a license to sin. As free, and we are free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Our glorious liberty in Jesus Christ is God's grace on the sin of our flesh to which we often disappoint his righteousness. See, Paul, saved by grace, kept by grace through faith, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Was as human as you and I. And he struggled with sin in his flesh as much as you and I. And he could not always be what his Savior would have him to be. But God said, my grace is sufficient. And it is. But it wasn't a license. A covenant is an agreement or contract between men or between men and God. Generally, it's based on certain conditions that are agreed upon. Sometimes, as between God and man, it is unconditional. God's covenants with man originate with him and generally consist of a promise based on the fulfillment of certain conditions. In the covenant that God had with Israel, in the Malachi dealing with them in the same manner that the scriptures deal with us, God had three questions for Judah. The first was, have we not all one father? Malachi was not referring to Father Abraham but to God, the father of Israel, and therefore the father of Judah. If we only have one God, if there's one faith, one hope, one God, there's one Bible, there's one truth, there's one way, there shouldn't be a confusion to that. Amen. And I also say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I said, I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So as it was with Israel, God was the father. Today, if you are born again, we are the sons of God. We have one father. The second question affirms the first, and hath not one God created us? But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by name, thou art mine. Now, Israel was created by God. The body of Christ was created by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have one God, we have one Savior. We have one Bible, and one way of righteousness. They were created by him for his glory and for his pleasure. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. It was that way in the Old Testament covenant, and it is the same way in the New Testament covenant. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You and I, in the body of Christ, were created by Christ's sacrifice on the cross to bring glory to God. The entire creation was and is for God's pleasure. Now the question is, how do we bring pleasure to God? By walking in his spirit, in the spirit of righteousness and truth, not in a deceived, contrived liberty to sin. If covenants are to fulfill righteousness, they require godly character on behalf of the covenants. Those who would 
consecrate themselves to God were considered his jewels. Then they that feared the Lord spake off one to another. Notice the warm brotherhood, the family relationship. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. In the Old Testament, under the law, God had a family. There were not all Israel that were of Israel, but the jewels were the ones that feared the Lord and spoke one another often about God. Sadly, the people of God are often found to be unfaithful in their relationship with God and with their families and friends. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Such that do so are to be rebuked. It's not God's way. Cry aloud. Spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sin. There's a fear of man today, and many ministers are afraid to tell saved, born-again Christians they are wrong to walk in sin, and they are only right to walk in the Spirit. Because the love of many is waxing cold and iniquity is abounding in these last days. As the nation is confused, and I use America in its political, so Christians today are confused in the scriptures because they don't read them, study them, believe them, and follow them and listen to God. And they're leading many astray. There's a scripture warning in the Old Testament because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will forget thy children. There's a doctrine, and there's many false doctrines in the body of Christ today. It's called Calvinism. Most Calvinistic people are saved, born again Christians that became embittered against serving the Lord and witnessing and testifying for him and sought to justify themselves so they embraced this doctrine with its heret heretical teachings. They can't lose their salvation, but what they've done with irresistible grace is condemn their children to damnation. because their children are not being given the gospel of salvation and redemption. Heresies like this one with a license to sin hurt those to come. God ministers are to rebuke God's people in the Lord. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. The Bible says to go out and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. Those who embrace tulip doctrines never do such a thing. Saved Christians with damnable heresies hurting others. Those that are saved and walk in sin harm and hurt the innocent. And it's wrong. The rebuke to God's people, both Old Testament and New Testament, was unfaithfulness, as holiness, and infidelity with a strange God. Judah has dealt treacherously, and abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah had profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved and had married the daughter of a strange God. God likens spiritual adultery to the physical adultery of men in their covenant with their wives. And he uses that in the Old Testament. God also uses that in the New Testament. 
ye adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's the problem why Christians want to be saved by grace and live in disgrace because they want to be friends with the world and the way of the world. They don't love God as they should. This was the reason for the prophet Hosea marrying a wife that was purchased as redeemed of the Lord are purchased by his blood. Then said the Lord unto me, Go, yet love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who looked to other gods and loved flagons of wine. Notice the wine because it's a false spirit. It's not God's spirit, but it's an alien spirit that it creates. When I ask people, if they read the Bible, and say, oh yeah, I read the Bible. I ask and say, who was the prophet that God told to marry a whore? And they look like, oh, I don't know about this. Well, there it is, folks. You see, if you read the word of God, then you would know because that is a very salient, outstanding verse, and it's undeniable. It hits you right in the face. God commanded his prophet to marry a whore because God was using that illustration saying, my people are full of whoredoms. And you know what? The same as the Old Testament is in the New Testament today where people are saved by grace. People are not right with God. And God never gave a liberty to sin. He gave a liberty from sin. All the Lord's people are purchased by the shed blood of the Lord, Jesus Christ, upon Calvary's cross. Now look, so I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half a homer of barley. The prophet buys a wife of whoredoms as God bought us with his blood, children of whoredoms and unfaithfulness. God in his grace saved us in our disgrace, not to live in our disgrace, but to walk in his spirit. In vain did the prophet seek conversion of the people of the Lord in their faithfulness to holiness of his law and his ways. Though Hosea as the Lord commanded faithfulness, only unfaithfulness was not to be found in the flesh of most men. Now look at what Hosea says to her. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. We're in those latter days because Israel's in the land. It's prophesied in Ezekiel. God is preparing to deal with his people. Judgment must begin first at the house of God. God is going to be dealing and is dealing with the church today and is preparing to deal with Israel in the very near future. And the whole issue is spiritual adultery just likened unto physical adultery. Spiritual adultery under the law sent the adulterer to hell. The Lord will cut off the man that doth this, the master and the scholar of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. So God cut Israel off and cast her out because she lived a whore. She was adulterous spiritually. Spiritual adultery under grace with eternal life cannot send the sinner to hell as it did under law. Yet it can often result in the loss of the sinner's life, the loss of the sinner's reward, the loss of the sinner's inheritance, and the loss of many other things. New Testament, for other foundation, can no man lay than that laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Is 
it good or is it bad? Is it evil or is it righteous? If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not? that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. New Testament, stark warning to God's people that will not walk in his spirit after saved by his grace. You can lose your life, you can lose your health, you can lose your wealth, you can lose your inheritance, you can lose anything and everything but your soul because in New Testament grace doctrine, your soul is in the hand of God, not in your hand. But friend, this spirit telling Christians and being taught that once you're saved, you can do anything you want is of the devil and it's destroying God's people. A born-again Christian can lose everything he possesses in this life, and most certainly he will lose his peace and joy through spiritual and physical adultery. No adulterer, spiritual or physical, has abiding joy. That's a fact. So why is that? There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. When the eternal soul is kept by the gift of God through grace through the shed blood of Christ for all eternity. But God commendeth his love towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. We are saved by grace. We are kept by grace. But there is a price to be paid for sin in the saints. It's a loss of joy. It's a loss of peace. It can be a loss of wealth. It can be a loss of inheritance. It can be a loss of many, many things. And a righteous preaching, teaching pastor has to warn the saints where you cannot lose your soul because of God's grace and his salvation. You can lose anything and everything else, and you're going to lose your joy and peace if you commit adultery, spiritual or physical, and this walk in sin. God still takes spiritual and physical adultery as serious as ever. And this have ye done, again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering of any more or receiveth it with good will at your hand. You want to know how a baby Christian is a carnal baby Christian and this goes into the charismatic realm? You little kids do when they do wrong and they know that they're under wrath or judgment. They cry like babies. You know what baby Christians do? They have this emotional fit where they're crying and, and, and acting like little babies. It's called the charismatic movement. It's called the emerging church. They're confused. They don't realize that they're supposed to have a sound mind in Christ. They're supposed to walk in the spirit and have grace for others and walk without sin. Not a license to sin. Now I know all saved saints sin, but it should be through accident, not through predetermined desire. And so they tried to have their emotional crying jag to justify themselves. Emotional weeping and crying out while remaining in immoral, depraved conduct will not change God's righteousness into accepting a man's willful lasciviousness. Yet you say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. God does not believe in divorce. 
God realizes and accepts the fact that divorces happen because babies depart for irreconcilable differences because they're immature. But if a man and a woman are mature in the Lord, they cannot, will not have a divorce. God does not believe in divorce. He hates putting away. God hates putting away. Be it physical or spiritual, the Lord is looking for a godly seed in character and consecration. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit? And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit. Let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garments, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you deal not treacherously. The only reason people have irreconcilable divorces is because they deal with one another treacherously. It's that simple. Saved or lost, Old Testament or New Testament, sin still remains sin. Right is always right. Wrong is always wrong. The emotions cannot change the facts of truth. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. That's the fact. If you do right, you're right. If you do wrong, you're wrong. Just because a saint is redeemed and given eternal life through the shed blood of the Lamb does not mean there are not many other grave consequences for immoral conduct. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now, the eternal God, the eternal spirit cannot be wearied, but God states it this way so that we can understand it. And the Lord is wearied with saints in sin. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? Character is demonstrated by unchanging righteousness and real consecration to God and man. See here, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that was an error, Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Marriage is another covenant found in the scriptures that was instituted by God and is extremely abused by man. And he answers down to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. God's marriage is forever. Man puts it asunder. In the age where liberty and license have replaced morality and loyalty. Did you hear that? In the age where liberty and license have replaced morality and loyalty. There is a greater need than ever before that we be disciplined and taught the character befitting, uh, befitting his disciples, who are the trophies of his grace, won by his perfect righteousness in obedience to the Father's will in holy love and faithfulness. Look at your Savior and put him on, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. The Lord Jesus Christ obeyed to the death. 
The scriptures do not say in vain, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. For the Lord was the sacrifice for our redemption, yet he trusts his father to the death. God hates putting away both Old and New Testament. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Men deal treacherously with God. God, in the spirit of goodness, redeems and saves men. Men in rebellion forsake God. Yes, we are certainly free from a departing unbeliever. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean. But now they are holy. Now watch. But if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. You and I are not under bondage of other people's sin. If a brother or sister departs, you're free. Yet we are not to depart or put our way our spouses. My eyes should be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. You see, Jesus said that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Our eternal security comes through God's faithfulness. When God, if you want to use the term, marries us, he marries us for eternity. He does not put us away for our sin. We are not to put away others for their sin, but to remain faithful with God in his spirit. That's real Christianity. That's the doctrines of the scriptures. That's the revealed truth of God's word. God has a plan for his saints. Wives, submit yourselves on your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. God commands the wives to submit to the husband. God's plan is faithful, godly love, and reciprocity and reciprocity. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It's very easy, it should be easy, for a woman to submit herself to a man that would die for her. God expects the man to be willing to die for the husband, which is for the wife. God expects the man to be willing to die for the wife. I hope I got that right. And God expects the wife to submit herself to a husband that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. That's God's plan. That's God's will. That's God's way. Are you walking in God's plan, God's will, God's way? Are you a trophy of grace? that brings pleasure, or are you a trophy of grace that brings disgrace to God's grace? Friend, broad is the way, and many there go in very few. There are many seducing spirits. There is one faith, one hope, one God, one book, one way, one truth. never been saved there's one savior or hellfire and damnation is your destination and if you are saved there's only one way to walk in the righteousness of the spirit or what you sow you shall reap and you shall suffer loss but not the loss of your soul because faithful is he saved you. 
our God is a faithful God. My Savior, your Savior, is a faithful Savior. He wants you to be faithful to him. He certainly loves you. Will you love him and keep his commandments? Come to church. God's way is the right way, the best way. It's the way of righteousness, peace, 